Vladimir Komarov, Soyuz 1. On April 22, 1967, Vladimir Komarov walked through the corridors of the Baikonur Cosmodrome, knowing he was likely walking to his death. The 40-year-old Soviet cosmonaut had been selected to pilot Soyuz 1, the first crewed flight of the Soviet Union's new spacecraft designed to outpace America's Apollo program. But Komarov knew what his superiors were hiding from the public. His friend and fellow cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin had desperately tried to convince mission planners to delay the flight. Over 200 technical problems had been identified in the Soyuz spacecraft during pre-flight testing, including critical failures in the parachute system, unstable attitude control, and faulty heat shield bonding. Soviet engineers had submitted report after report documenting these dangerous defects, but political pressure from the Kremlin overruled safety concerns. The mission was scheduled to coincide with Lenin's birthday and the May Day Parade, giving Communist Party leaders a propaganda victory they desperately needed. Komarov understood the impossible situation. If he refused to fly, his backup pilot Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space and a Soviet hero, would take his place. Komarov couldn't let his friend die in a spacecraft he knew was defective. At 3.35 a.m. Moscow time on April 23rd, Soyuz 1 lifted off from Baikonur into the pre-dawn darkness. The problems began almost immediately. One of the spacecraft's two solar panels failed to deploy properly, cutting power generation in half and making it impossible to properly orient the craft toward the sun. Without adequate solar panel positioning, the spacecraft's batteries began draining rapidly. The ion sensors that controlled the craft's attitude became unreliable, causing Soyuz 1 to tumble uncontrollably through space. Komarov fought to stabilize his ship manually, using precious fuel reserves to fire the attitude control thrusters. Ground control monitored the mounting problems with growing alarm. The planned rendezvous with Soyuz 2, which was supposed to launch the next day with three cosmonauts aboard, was immediately canceled. After 18 increasingly desperate orbits, Mission Control ordered Komarov to attempt an emergency re-entry over the Soviet Union. As Soyuz 1 began its descent on April 24, Komarov manually oriented his spacecraft for re-entry, knowing his life depended on systems that had already proven unreliable. The descent through the upper atmosphere proceeded normally at first, with the heat shield protecting the crew compartment as designed. But as the spacecraft slowed to subsonic speeds at an altitude of 23,000 feet, the main parachute container failed to open properly due to a design flaw that engineers had identified months earlier. The parachute became tangled within its container, providing virtually no drag to slow the spacecraft's descent. Komarov deployed the backup parachute system, but it immediately became twisted with the partially deployed main chute and the drogue parachute, creating a tangled mess that was completely ineffective. Soviet listening posts on the ground recorded Komarov's final transmissions as he plummeted toward Earth at over 250 miles per hour. He cursed the engineers and officials who had forced him to fly in a defective spacecraft, knowing he had less than a minute to live. At 7.24 a.m., Soyuz 1 struck the ground near Orenburg with tremendous force, creating a crater and instantly igniting the spacecraft's remaining fuel. The impact was so violent that the spherical descent module was completely flattened into a disk barely a meter high. Komarov's body was burned beyond recognition, fused to the twisted metal of his spacecraft. It took recovery teams hours to separate his remains from the wreckage. His death forced a complete overhaul of the Soviet space program, delaying crewed flights for 18 months while engineers redesigned the parachute system and addressed hundreds of other safety issues that political pressure had forced them to ignore. Soyuz 11 Crew On June 6, 1971, Soviet cosmonauts Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev launched aboard Soyuz 11 from Baikonur Cosmodrome beginning what appeared to be a routine mission to dock with Salyut-1, the world's first operational space station. The three men were experienced spaceflight veterans, with Dobrovolsky serving as commander, Volkov as flight engineer, and Patsayev as research engineer. Their mission was to spend three weeks aboard the space station, conducting scientific experiments and proving that humans could live and work in space for extended periods. The launch proceeded flawlessly, and 24 hours later, Soyuz-11 successfully docked with Salyut-1, making the crew the first humans to occupy a space station. For the next 22 days, the cosmonauts conducted a wide variety of experiments, including astronomical observations, materials processing, biological research, and Earth photography. They established new endurance records for spaceflight duration and proved that humans could adapt to long-term weightlessness. Their daily communications with ground control were upbeat and professional, with no indication of any problems aboard the station. The crew exceeded all their planned objectives and even requested additional experiments to fill their remaining time. On June 29th, after completing their highly successful mission, 
The crew sealed the hatches between Salyut 1 and their Soyuz 11 spacecraft and prepared for the journey home. The undocking sequence proceeded normally at 2128 Moscow time, with the spacecraft separating cleanly from the space station. Forty minutes later, the crew fired their service module engine for the deorbit burn, beginning their descent toward a landing site in Kazakhstan. All spacecraft systems appeared to be functioning normally as Soyuz 11 entered the upper atmosphere. The service module and orbital module separated from the descent module as planned, leaving the three cosmonauts sealed inside the small spherical capsule that would carry them through re-entry and landing. The heat shield performed perfectly, protecting the crew compartment from the extreme temperatures generated by atmospheric friction. The drogue parachute deployed at the correct altitude, followed by the main parachute, which opened properly and slowed the spacecraft to a safe descent rate. The soft landing rockets fired automatically just before touchdown, cushioning the impact as Soyuz 11 settled gently onto the Kazakhstan steppe at 2.17 a.m. on June 30th. Recovery helicopters were already circling overhead, and ground crews rushed to the spacecraft expecting to congratulate three heroes who had just set a new spaceflight duration record. When the recovery team opened the hatch of the descent module, they found all three cosmonauts still strapped in their seats, motionless and blue-faced. There were no signs of impact trauma or fire, but the men were clearly dead. Medical examination revealed that the crew had suffocated when a pressure equalization valve had opened prematurely during the descent sequence, allowing the cabin atmosphere to vent into the vacuum of space. The valve was designed to equalize cabin pressure with the outside atmosphere just before landing, but it had malfunctioned and opened while the spacecraft was still above the Karman line at an altitude of 550,000 feet. The cabin depressurized in just 112 seconds, causing rapid decompression that the unprotected crew could not survive. Investigation revealed that the valve had been damaged during the separation sequence when explosive bolts fired to jettison the orbital and service modules. A bolt or piece of debris had damaged the valve mechanism, causing it to open at the wrong time. The crew had likely lost consciousness within 15 to 20 seconds of decompression beginning and died within a minute from hypoxia. The tragedy led to major changes in Soviet spacecraft design, including reinforced pressure valves and the requirement that crews wear pressure suits during all launch and re-entry operations, a practice that continues today. Challenger Disaster STS-51L On the morning of January 28, 1986, Space Shuttle Challenger sat on launch pad 39B at Kennedy Space Center, ready for its 10th mission into space. The crew of seven included Commander Francis Dick Scobie, Pilot Michael Smith, Mission Specialists Judith Resnick, Ellison Onizuka, and Ronald McNair, Payload Specialist Gregory Jarvis, and Krista McAuliffe, a high school teacher from New Hampshire, who had been selected as the first participant in NASA's Teacher in Space program. The launch had been delayed multiple times due to weather conditions and technical issues, creating mounting pressure from NASA management and the media to proceed with the mission. The night before launch, engineers at Morton Thiokol, the company that manufactured the shuttle's solid rocket boosters, discovered that overnight temperatures had dropped to 18 degrees Fahrenheit, far below the minimum temperature at which the rubber O-ring seals in the rocket boosters had been tested. Senior engineers Roger Boisjoli and Alan McDonald strongly recommended postponing the launch, warning that the cold, stiffened O-rings might not seal properly and could allow hot gases to escape from the rocket motors. During a heated teleconference that lasted until midnight, NASA officials challenged Thiokol's concerns, arguing that there was no conclusive proof that cold weather would cause seal failure. Under intense pressure to avoid another delay, Thiokol management overruled their own engineers and gave NASA permission to proceed with the launch. At 11.38 a.m. EST, with hundreds of spectators watching, including McAuliffe's family and students from her school, Challenger lifted off into a clear blue sky. The shuttle's three main engines and two solid rocket boosters functioned normally during the first minute of flight, accelerating the vehicle toward orbit. However, at 59 seconds after liftoff, high-speed cameras captured a small flame appearing near the bottom joint of the right solid rocket booster. The cold, stiffened O-rings had failed exactly as the engineers had predicted, allowing superheated gas at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit to escape and act like a blowtorch against the external fuel tank. The flame rapidly grew larger, burning through the strut that connected the right booster to the external tank and weakening the tank's structural supports. At 72 seconds into the flight, Traveling at Mach 1.92 at an altitude of 48,000 feet, the compromised external tank ruptured, releasing thousands of gallons of liquid hydrogen and oxygen that mixed explosively. The massive explosion didn't kill the crew immediately. The crew compartment, built to withstand the forces of launch and re-entry, was thrown clear of the explosion and began falling toward the Atlantic Ocean in a ballistic arc. 
Emergency oxygen systems activated automatically, and at least some of the crew members were likely conscious during the fall. Pilot Michael Smith was heard saying, uh-oh, just before the vehicle broke apart, indicating that the crew was aware something had gone catastrophically wrong. The crew compartment fell for 2 minutes and 45 seconds, reaching a speed of over 200 miles per hour before striking the ocean surface 18 miles offshore. The impact with the water was unsurvivable, killing all seven crew members instantly. NASA suspended shuttle flights for 32 months while a presidential commission investigated the accident and implemented design changes to prevent similar failures. The solid rocket boosters were completely redesigned with improved O-ring seals and joint heaters to ensure proper sealing in cold weather. Columbia Disaster, STS-107 On January 16, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia lifted off from Kennedy Space Center, carrying a crew of seven astronauts on a 16-day scientific research mission, designated STS-107. The crew included Commander Rick Husband, Pilot William McCool, Mission Specialists Kalpana Chala, David Brown, Laurel Clark, Michael Anderson, and Payload Specialist Ilan Ramon. The mission was dedicated to scientific research, with the crew operating over 80 experiments in a research module housed in Columbia's cargo bay. During the launch, cameras captured what appeared to be a large piece of foam insulation breaking away from the external fuel tank's bipod ramp area and striking Columbia's left-wing leading edge. The impact occurred 81.7 seconds after liftoff, when the shuttle was traveling at approximately 1,568 miles per hour at an altitude of 65,000 feet. The foam piece weighed approximately 1.67 pounds and measured about 21 by 27 inches, making it much larger than typical debris that occasionally separated from the external tank. NASA engineers reviewed the high-speed film footage of the impact, but concluded that foam strikes were a common occurrence that had never caused significant damage on previous missions. The debris assessment team, composed of engineers from NASA and Boeing, requested high-resolution images of Columbia's wing from military satellites or telescopes to assess the extent of any damage. However, shuttle program managers denied this request, stating that even if damage was found, nothing could be done to repair it since Columbia was not equipped for major repairs and could not reach the International Space Station. This decision would prove fatal, as the foam strike had indeed caused serious damage to the wing's thermal protection system. The impact had created a hole approximately 6 to 10 inches in diameter in one of the reinforced carbon-carbon panels that protected the wing's leading edge during re-entry. For the next 16 days, the crew conducted their scientific experiments completely unaware that their spacecraft had been fatally damaged. They completed all planned research activities, working in shifts around the clock to maximize the scientific return from their mission. Their daily communications with mission control were routine and upbeat, with no indication that anyone suspected a problem with the shuttle. On February 1, 2003, Columbia began its re-entry sequence over the Pacific Ocean, firing its orbital maneuvering system engines to slow down and drop out of orbit. As the shuttle descended through the upper atmosphere at over 17,000 miles per hour, it began encountering the first wisps of atmospheric gas that would gradually slow it down through friction. At first, the re-entry proceeded normally, with the crew following standard procedures for landing at Kennedy Space Center. However, as Columbia descended through increasingly dense atmosphere, superheated plasma began flowing through the hole in the left wing's leading edge. The temperature inside the wing structure quickly reached over 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, far exceeding the melting point of aluminum and causing the wing's internal framework to fail. Sensors throughout the left side of the spacecraft began registering abnormal temperature readings and system failures, but the crew was not immediately aware of the severity of the situation. At 8.59 a.m. EST, while traveling over Texas at an altitude of 207,000 feet, Columbia's left wing finally separated from the fuselage due to the structural damage caused by the superheated gas intrusion. The shuttle immediately became uncontrollable and broke apart due to aerodynamic forces, with debris scattered across Texas and Louisiana. The crew compartment was destroyed in the breakup, and all seven astronauts died instantly. The accident investigation led to major changes in shuttle operations, including detailed inspections of the thermal protection system on every mission and the capability to repair minor damage while in orbit. X-15, Flight 36597 On November 15, 1967, U.S. Air Force Major Michael J. Adams climbed into the cockpit of X-15-3 at Edwards Air Force Base for what would be his seventh flight in the experimental rocket plane. The 37-year-old test pilot had been selected for the X-15 program based on his exceptional skills flying high-performance aircraft, and he was being considered for NASA's astronaut corps. 
The X-15 was designed to explore the boundary between atmospheric flight and spaceflight, reaching altitudes above 50 miles where conventional aircraft could not operate. Adams's mission, designated Flight 36597, called for him to reach an altitude of 250,000 feet while testing a new ultraviolet stellar photography experiment and evaluating the aircraft's reaction controls in the near vacuum of space. The flight plan seemed routine by X-15 standards, but several factors would combine to create a deadly situation. At 10.30 a.m., Adams X-15 was released from the wing of a modified B-52 bomber at 45,000 feet over the Mojave Desert. He immediately ignited the XLR-99 rocket engine, which produced 57,000 pounds of thrust and accelerated the aircraft to over 3,800 miles per hour. As the X-15 climbed steeply through the atmosphere, Adams reported normal engine performance and aircraft handling. The rocket plane reached its planned altitude of 266,000 feet, officially entering space and making Adams the first person to die during a spaceflight. However, during the high-altitude portion of the flight, something went wrong with the aircraft's attitude control system. The X-15 began an inadvertent yaw motion that Adams initially didn't recognize because the thin atmosphere at that altitude provided almost no aerodynamic feedback. The spacecraft's reaction control system, designed to provide control in space, was not functioning properly, and Adams found himself in a slowly developing emergency that would prove fatal. As the X-15 began its descent back into the atmosphere, the yaw motion became more pronounced, causing the aircraft to enter a spin. Adams attempted to correct the problem using the aircraft's conventional aerodynamic controls, but at such high altitude and speed, they were largely ineffective. Ground controllers at Edwards Air Force Base tracked the aircraft's erratic flight path on radar and tried to provide guidance, but communications were intermittent due to the plasma sheath surrounding the hypersonic aircraft. As the X-15 descended through 200,000 feet, it began encountering thicker atmosphere, which should have allowed Adams to regain control using conventional flight controls. However, the aircraft's angle of attack had become so extreme that it was essentially flying sideways through the air at over 3,000 miles per hour. The aerodynamic forces on the aircraft were enormous and increasing rapidly as it entered denser air. At approximately 65,000 feet altitude, while traveling at Mach 3.5, the X-15 encountered G-forces that exceeded the structural limits of both the aircraft and the human body. The aircraft began to break apart under the extreme aerodynamic loads, with pieces separating from the main fuselage. Adams, subjected to forces exceeding 15 Gs, likely lost consciousness before the aircraft's final breakup. The main wreckage of X-15-3 impacted the ground near Johannesburg, California, creating a crater several feet deep. Adams's body was found still strapped in his ejection seat, but the seat had never been activated. Investigation revealed that the aircraft's adaptive flight control system had malfunctioned during the high-altitude portion of the flight, initiating the yaw motion that Adams was unable to correct. The tragedy led to improvements in pilot training for high-altitude flight and better backup control systems for spacecraft operating at the edge of the atmosphere. Adams was posthumously awarded astronaut wings for his flight, becoming the first person to earn them by dying in space. If you enjoyed this video, Subscribe for similar ones and feel free to drop suggestions for the next video in the comments.